Lauren Williams, and I'm Adult and Community Services Manager here at the Columbia Public Library. Thank you for being here today for this Lunch and Learn. Um, I have to say this is the uh, first time in a long while that we're back in person for Lunch and Learn. Uh, we have been doing this via Zoom since the um, start of the COVID, pan COVID pandemic, and we have people in the room, but also on Zoom. We're trying this in hybrid to make it as accessible as we, to as many people as possible. And I know we've got um, upwards of 40 folks registered online as well. So we appreciate you being here, whether you're in person or online. Um, today's Lunch and Learn is co-hosted by the Library, of the Columbia Branch of the American Association of University Women and the League of Women Voters of Columbia Boone County. Um, if you're on Zoom and want to ask a question, there is to just use the chat feature um, like we've been doing in the past, and we've got a, a moderator that will pass those questions on to our speaker. And we are recording this event, so it will be available uh, on the library's YouTube channel as well as the league's YouTube channel in just a few days. And so now I'd like to welcome Maurice Scala, president of the League of Women Voters of Columbia Boone County, to say a few words and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, the last time we met in person in this room for a lunch and learn, none of us would have even known what a hybrid meeting was. <laughs> but here we are. And it's so wonderful to see uh, the faces in the room and to know that we also have a lot of people who can join us on Zoom. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to introduce the uh, co president, Diane Ludwig, co president of the AAUW Columbia branch. And she's going to talk a little bit about this particular observance of one of the very important deceased members of any Thank you, Mari. I'm Diane Ludwig. I am the co-president of the American Association of University Women. I want to be able to see you. <laughs> okay. I should move to the side just a little bit. There you go. There you go. There there you go. go. I'm short anyway. Get out of my face. All right. <laughs> Once I rearrange the room. Okay. Um, we are pleased to be a part of this, and we call this for our group the Holly Burgess Public Policy Forum, and we do this every year. Now, maybe some of you remember Holly Burgess. Holly was a member of the league. She was a member of AUW. She was a staunch supporter of the library. She loved all of it, and she was a huge advocate for public policy and passionate about legislature, legislation and so forth. So when Holly passed away, way too early at 61 of leukemia. She was the president of our branch at the time and we decided we wanted to do something to honor her memory. And so we talked with her family and we decided to set up the Holly Burgess Public Policy Forum every year. And so for the last few years, we've been very blessed to be able to partner with the League of Women Voters and the library to do something like the lunch and learn session that we're having today. So I just wanted to give you a little heads up on who Holly Burgess is. So thank you for that opportunity, Mari. <clears throat> I'm thrilled that we are covering the topic that we are today because part of League of Women Voters' basic mission is voter service and education, and part of it is public policy advocacy, and this topic brings the two together just perfectly. So um, I'd like to introduce our speaker. <clears throat> Kathy Kiley is the Lee Hills Chair in Free Press Studies at the Missouri School of Journalism and serves on the board of the Missouri Sunshine Coalition. She's a veteran reporter and editor who spent most of her career in Washington, D.C., covering politics for USA Today and the New York Daily News, among other national and regional outlets. A, a member of one of the first Princeton University classes to admit women, she later earned a master's degree in interactive journalism from American University. Kylie served two years as a member of the Congressional Standing Committee of Correspondence and is now a trustee of Princeton University. So wow. we're very honored to have her here in Columbia, and she's going to talk to us about an occasion to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Missouri Sunshine Law. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for having me okay, here. Well, today. Well, yes, and I, okay, I'm going to move to the side. Is this better? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here to talk about um, the golden anniversary of a law that uh, too many of us take for granted. Now, in a sense, that's a good news. That's good news. 
we've become so accustomed to politics in sunshine that we forget what it's like to be without it. So today, I'm going to remind you by going into a little history of the Missouri Sunshine Law and then talking about how it fits into kind of the larger ecosystem of openness in government. Uh, because we really don't want to get blasé about something this important to democracy. So, first, a quick overview. All is not sunshine. <laughs> we are fortunate to have a sunshine law, but it's not exactly a breeze for ordinary citizens or even for trained journalists to use. And because sunshine tends to come low on the list of uh, priorities for government funding, there are often long waits to get the information you've requested. Nonetheless, with all of that said, uh, not perfect, but we have established the principle that, that the public's business should be conducted in public. That's important because Things can pretty much go to hell without it. Let me see if I can show you this. This is um, this is a little video that I took. Uh, I shot it out of windows of a van when several of my colleagues and I were visiting Niger. Niger is one of the poorest countries in Africa. We were there to help train journalists. We were accompanied everywhere by a phalanx of heavily armed soldiers and trucks with mounted machine guns, one ahead of us and one behind. That's because Niger is not safe. There are a lot of kidnappings. Notice to the unpaved roads. Notice, if you did, that they run in front of some pretty substantial looking buildings. We saw many of those buildings bristling with antenna suggesting they house pretty sophisticated home entertainment systems. To me, the disparity between the dusty roads and the gated complexes tells you everything you need to know about why sunshine is important in government. If you don't have it, corruption festers. The rich get richer and the public doesn't even get the most basic of services. We all behave better when we know somebody's watching. Now, oops, let's see. Let's, I want to make it go to the next slide. There we go. Okay. My, my, my main means of publication for most of my career has been a printing press, so you'll have to excuse me with the technology. Um, so uh, that, that we all behave better if we know somebody's watching us. That is the fundamental fact of human psychology that I think led to such a major uh, bipartisan push for the Sunshine Law. The Sunshine Law was signed into law, the bill was signed into law on August 9th, 1973 by Kit Bond, who you see up there on the left. Kit Bond, uh, who then uh, went on to become a senator from Missouri, was then the governor, and he was a Republican. So was Jack Danforth, the other gentleman you see up there, who was the first state attorney general tasked with enforcing the Sunshine Law. Danforth also went on to become a U.S. Senator. Bond and, and Danforth served together. I covered them when they were in the Senate. Um, but, so those were two Republicans. But the chief legislative sponsors of the bill, Bill Kaysen, uh, who was a representative, I a senator uh, from uh, the western part of the state, uh, state representative uh, Howard Volkmer, who later became a congressman, and state representative Albert Spradling, they were all Democrats. As enacted, the bill was pretty brief, about a page and a half of text. The two key innovations that mandated, number one, you see that here, and I'm just gonna boil it down. Basically what this says is, meetings of government bodies must be open to the public and officials' votes 
must be recorded. And then number two, public bodies need to notify the public when they're doing public business. That's so people can be there to register an opinion. And as you'll see, it's not just average citizens. So there are a few common sense exceptions to this. Uh, for police work, uh, there are exceptions for some legal proceedings. I see one of my students here is going to law school. She'll be concerned about that. Um, and, uh, and then there is a, a, obviously things like mental health proceedings. There are exceptions to the Sunshine Law. But generally, the presumption is supposed to be in favor of openness in government. Now, I want you to um, see the, to appreciate before we go on to the, the gravity of this. Before 1973, you could not assume that a meeting of your local city council or school board or zoning board would be open to you. They could just have a meeting and not let you know, or members of the press. Because we do this job for you. Not everybody has time to go to all those meetings. So that's why we do. So we write the stories for you to read or the broadcast items. So those were not open. Think about that. They didn't have to be open. And furthermore, you could not assume that you would be able to find how your elected representatives voted. So this is, to give you a sense, I'm gonna let you hear from the lawmakers themselves who created this law about why they did it. So uh, this is Spradling, Albert Spradling, the state rep. So we opened up meetings and I've always thought that was good because now then you can get to the truth and actually find out where the money's going and what's happening in the cities. I don't suppose, this was in an oral history to the Missouri State Historical Society. I don't suppose, he said, I've ever handled a more controversial bill. Think about that. That was controversial because a lot of people got to members of the legislature from these cities and said, my gosh, kill that damn thing or they'll find out who's doing what. <laughs> and he said, this was one piece of legislation that I really had trouble with. So um, that is where we were at that time. And then, uh, but Spradling told the interviewer from the State Historical Society, he said that was the piece of legislation that he was proudest of, of all the things he passed. And so the State Historical Society has a wonderful library of oral histories. And um, I looked at another oral history of a lawmaker who was involved in this. This is Bill Kaysen, the state senator. And um, he also said the same thing. The, the lawmaker, or the interviewer, whose name was Will Sarvis, said, what's the bill that you're the proudest of? And if this works, let's see if the technology works, you'll be able to hear Bill Kaysen say it in his own voice. The only meeting law, the Sunshine Law, is my legislation. We didn't have any such thing. It used to aggravate me. School boards would meet even when I was on it. And they'd want to meet in secret and not tell anybody who voted which way. And you couldn't find out what people did. And they call special meetings uh, of the city council and pass something you didn't even know was going to come up that you would have opposed for good reason. And I was re really bothered by this concept. And also down to the General Assembly, uh, committees would meet without notice and put a bill out. And uh, uh, that should never have come out. But maybe you would have opposed if you'd known it was going to come up for a hearing. So you see, it wasn't just um, wasn't just citizens. Even lawmakers were shut out of the process. Could be shut out of the process. So, um, in and further, these oral histories. By the way, both of these oral histories that I just quoted from Spradling and Kaysen were uh, taken in 1996. Both of them are no longer with us, but. It's wonderful to hear, and some of them have been digitized so you can hear their voices, and it's really wonderful to hear their own words and their own voice about why they did this. 
Uh, but in, in his oral history, Albert Spradling also said that it was Missouri newspapers that came to him and lobbied him to introduce and back an open meetings law. And today, the news business remains the biggest, we, the journalists, are still the biggest cheerleaders for sunshine. Since 19, or I'm sorry, since 2005, um, news industry leaders, um, which is a group that, um, of news, that's what it says, editors and publishers, um, they have designated the second week of March as Sunshine Week. And we, you'll see stories in newspapers, and we try to have events to remind people of why sunshine is so important. And uh, you might wonder why that week. Well, that's interesting, too, because it's an indication of how deeply this idea of openness, even though we haven't always observed it, but this idea that the government should be open, that is so deeply embedded in the United States. And that's why this week was picked because mid-March is the birthday of James Madison, March 16th. And so the week always falls on James Madison's birthday. Uh, Madison, of course, is the author of the Bill of Rights, uh, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and those of us at the journalism school uh, certainly know the significance of the very first one. Um, but, but we've had that since the founding of the Republic, uh, freedom of speech really doesn't count for much if you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and by the late 19th and early 20th century, politics and public life had become too much of an insider cabal. You know, our democracy had gotten much bigger than it was back at the founding. And now it was big enough that we had insiders running things uh, from the infamous smoke-filled rooms and decisions got made by a handful of people, uh, powerful people and their cronies. And so enter Louis Brandeis. Uh, Louis Brandeis, uh, long before he became the first Jewish justice of the US Supreme Court, uh, was one of, and one of our country's most revered legal people. Brandeis was a muckraker. He was crusading against political corruption in his native Boston. There's a little bit of that in Boston. <laughs> um, so Brandeis really was one of the leading intellectuals behind the so-called progressive movement. And that is a movement, of course, that you know, uh, led to sweeping reforms designed to open government and also to limit the influence of money in politics. Mm -hmm. That is largely what the uh, trust busting movement was all about. Now, in a famous essay for Harper's Weekly back in 1913, Brandeis turned a phrase that decades later would name a movement. Sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, he wrote. Mm -hmm. In other words, we all behave better when we know somebody's watching. So that the, uh, the movement came along and uh, the progressive movement had a lot of reforms, that was great, but power brokers have a way of backsliding. And by the mid 20th century, it was time for another movement for openness in government, one that took some better part of a decade to unfold. It began, many people think, when this man, John Moss, a Republican, was elected to represent Sacramento in the U.S. Congress. At that time, California was kind of a backwater, so nobody was expecting too much from this guy, John Moss. But two years later, he became chairman of a special house subcommittee on government information. Now, I'm going to tell you, that sounds like a backwater to me. Oh, look, this guy, he's, we'll give, make this special committee for him. <laughs> but John Moss didn't let it be that. Uh, he began holding meetings with press leaders and with uh, government officials and asking a lot of questions, annoying questions, <laughs> kind of questions journalists ask. Now, according to Moss's biographers, one of the things, and maybe the thing that motivated him, 
was McCarthyism. In his first race for Congress, Moss was accused of being a communist or a communist sympathizer. He managed to beat that, but when he got to that, he found other people in the same boat, government employees, even employees of private companies, like companies in Hollywood, were being fired without due process after being publicly accused of being reds. Um, and then that made them unemployable. Not only did they lose their job, they couldn't find another one. Moss pressed to find out the source, the sources, and the veracity of this damaging information. Eventually, as you all know, with the help of some courageous journalists, the Red Scare was debunked. But the congressman's efforts to, over, to open government records languished until the 1960s. Now, what finally motivated his colleagues to join Moss was the secrecy surrounding an undeclared war that killed more than 58,000 Americans. This excerpt from Moss's obituary in the Sacramento Bee describes how the congressman became a leader in the effort to poke holes in the Johnson administration's justification for the war in Vietnam. As you can see, Moss, kind of like a journalist, went over to Vietnam and started asking a lot of annoying questions, as this uh, article notes, meticulous, meticulously exposing the corruption and the futility of a US nation building campaign and, and for a regime that would not ever meet democratic standards. Um, now, interestingly, one of the most ardent supporters of Moss's Freedom of Information Act was a young Republican congressman, a Republican congressman from Illinois named Donald Rumsfeld, <laughs> who we later knew better as the Secretary of Defense. And I think when he was Secretary of Defense, uh, Rum Rummy may not have been as enthusiastic about openness in government, but, <laughs> but my point is this was bipartisan. Um, and the Freedom of Information Act, which Moss spent all those years working for, uh, finally was signed into law on July 4th, 1966. Uh, now this day is not as auspicious as you might think. President Lyndon Johnson signed the bill on July 4th, not because he wanted to underscore the importance of openness to the American system, but because he was hoping he could keep attention off the bill by signing it on a federal <laughs> holiday. <laughs> um, he really hated it, um, but he knew Congress would override him if he vetoed it. Again, there was that much bipartisan support for openness in government. Now the FOIA, as it is called, created a presumption of openness in federal records. But as any good student of our federalist system knows, states can follow their own paths. The American Society of Newspaper Editors, now the News Leaders Association, had been working since 1950 to, or the, or the early 50s, to open state meetings and records. But the effort got a major new impetus in the 1970s from another big development on the national front. First newspaper reporters, then Congress, and then the courts began to investigate the Watergate scandal that brought down President Richard Nixon. The public demanded reform and elected a new generation of politicians who promised to make that happen. Danforth and Bond were among their party's reformers and they eagerly took up the Sunshine Law when Missouri's then majority Democratic legislature brought it to them. Then three years after Bond signed the Missouri bill, another Republican, Gerald Ford, signed a bill to provide sunshine at the federal level. Now, while Moss's 1966 FOIA Act made public records open, it took this bill, the Government and Sunshine Act, signed 10 years later, 
to, to make government meetings open as well. I don't think we'd have C-SPAN without the government and Sunshine Act. So again, keep in mind, Republican governor, Republican president, Democratic Congress, Democratic legislature, everybody was for this at that time. And when this bill was passed, I went back and looked. Not a single dissenting vote was cast in either the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate. Totally bipartisan. But, as I've said before, power brokers have a way of backsliding. So here we are, 50 years after the Sunshine Law was enacted in our state, and it is increasingly, the, the idea of public access is increasingly under threat. Earlier this year, our state legislature considered exempting its own records from the Sunshine Law, despite a 2018 statewide vote by Missourians to require them to open those records. The measure to collapse the Sunshine provision never made it to the Senate floor, but there's no assurance it won't come up again in the next session. More recently, we've heard a lot about backlogs in getting records from state offices, Sunshine being slow walked, right? Well, this just in, this just in today, uh, Attorney General Andrew Bailey's office says it has a staff of five working hard to winnow down the backlog of some 3, 300 Sunshine requests uh, that Bailey says he inherited from his predecessor, Eric Schmidt. So that's good, but we've also seen revelations uh, that um, of a memo that the current Attorney General, Andrew Bailey, wrote uh, when he was working for the governor as the governor's legal counsel, and that memo proposed different ways the Sunshine Law could be weakened. Now, let's face it, why, why would people be turning against this? Um, these days, when nobody wants to pay taxes, sunshine is expensive. It requires, uh, it's a pain, uh, and it, it requires a lot of man and woman power because these requests take time to fill, got to look up records. You've got to redact personal or sensitive information that might not be appropriate for public disclosure. And sometimes people abuse the sunshine law by filing request after, uh, you know, uh, not a, a, a request that's not really a serious, a frivolous request, and just dumping these on local governments which don't have the money to, to do all of this work. So that is a, that is a genuine problem, um, but to quote Winston Churchill, or <laughs> to use a quote that he made famous, it really wasn't his quote, Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other, right? <laughs> I mean, so yes, yeah, sunshine is a pain, but it is obviously a tool that is fundamental to democracy. Um, a, a public can't make good decisions about who its leaders should be or what directions our society can take without good information. So, um, and this goes on as Jean, uh, let me see, and this is Jean's, uh, Jean Manneke, who is a lawyer for the Missouri Press Association, had a column in the most recent issue of the, of, uh, the MPA uh, magazine. And it's very interesting. Um, it talks about um, how citizens um, are now unable, there's a new law that prohibits people from getting, or even public officials who have hiring decisions to make, from learning about official complaints about cops. <laughs> so a police officer could be, have a disciplinary action, have a complaint filed, the disciplinary board could find against the police officer, and under this new law that exempts those proceedings from the Sunshine Bill, that police officer could go to the next community and no one would ever know, right? So this law is now in front of, and by the way, my slideshow will be made available to you and almost everything here is a hot link. And so this is a hot link. 
So if you click on it, it'll take you to a link to Jean's article and you can read the whole thing. Um, if you don't subscribe to the Missouri Press Association magazine, which <laughs> perhaps those of you who are not journalists <laughs> don't do. Um, but let me go back because I meant to show this earlier. I'm not going to show this, but this is also a hot link. This process of eroding the Sunshine Law has been going on almost since it was passed. And you can watch this at home. It's about four minutes long. It's a piece that KOMU did. My uh, colleague Taylor Freeman um, did on in, in August at the, on the actual anniversary of the Sunshine Bill. And, and what it talks about is how this bill, remember I said it was a page and a half when it ori originally passed, it has now ballooned to like 30 pages in the Missouri statute books. And almost every single one of those uh, is an exemption to the Sunshine Law. Now, as I detailed you, as a journalist, I am, I am not unsympathetic. There are things that we might not, there are things that even in the original Sunshine Bill, we recognize that there were things that weren't appropriate to put out there for everybody to see. But the presumption should be for the public's right to know. And increasingly, it's less that way. Jean uh, talks, Jean writes about this all the time. She's a Kansas City lawyer who used to be a journalist and um, works for the Missouri Press Association. And you know, she's quite, she's actually quoted in Taylor's piece. She's quite discouraged. You know, she feels like we're about to lose sunshine. And so uh, I think, you know, I've tried to explain to you some of the context of this, but I, I think we can all understand um, what why it's important to be able to have open meetings. I think we can all understand why it's important for us to be able to find out how our elected representatives voted. But there are there's other information that under sunshine is public and uh, that affects your lives in ways that I think we often don't appreciate. Um, so budgets are public because of the sunshine bill. Uh, so are records of entities that the government regulates. Um, is that company down the street from you storing toxic waste? Is the train line behind you carrying toxic waste? I think the people in there are people in Ohio who would have something to say about that. Now you'd like to know those things. These are things that you can find out by using the Sunshine Law and the FOIA, which is the Federal Sunshine Law. And citizens do; they can and they do. This is a book by uh, another MU journalism professor, my colleague Allison Young, and she used FOIA to document a range of really scary lab leaks. Do not read this before going to bed. <laughs> uh, because, uh, it, and, and they suggest, uh, her reporting suggests how very easy it would be to inadvertently, through carelessness, start the next pandemic. <clears throat> so this is the kind of information that I think is very valuable to the public and, um, and is important uh, to understand and and important for you to fight for. Um, so I said if there's time left, I think there's a little bit of time. I wanted to tell you my own sunshine story. So most of my career as a journalist, I never used the sunshine law. I never used FOIA. I was a political reporter, you know, and most of the politicians, it's like, please put my name in the paper, you know, <laughs> worry about it, not talking to me. Um, but as a volunteer for the National Press Club some years ago, six years ago, actually, I crossed paths with this guy, Emilio Gutierrez. And Emilio is a Mexican journalist. He's not famous. He's not a big deal. He is a journalist who worked in a, for a string of little small town newspapers, you know, kind of the uh, Moberly, Missouri or Mexico, right? And uh, he worked for them. And, uh, and one day he found out about uh, military officials shaking down members of the public, barging into hotels, insisting on having their watches or this, that. And he reported it. And his life changed. Uh, his house was broken into. He was threatened. 
a single dad, father of a young boy, not even a teenager yet. And, um, you know, I don't know how many of you realize this, but in Mexico, these things can't be, you don't fluff them off. Mexico is because of the uh, cartels and how the cartels have really control a lot of the government, a lot of the military. Mexico is the most dangerous place to be a journalist outside of a war zone. Uh, that's how many people have been killed and kidnapped there. So Emilio took it seriously. He went, he was told by a confidential source that there was a hit out on him. And uh, so he went to a border crossing of the United States, legally, legally entered the United States asking for asylum. And it's a long story with a lot of details, but the, the short version of it is he lived quite um, law as a law-abiding way and made friends and had a business um, until um, until somebody suddenly on one of his um, visits to check in with the, the immigration officials, he was handcuffed and they wanted to deport him to the country where he was threatened with death. Of course, it's not doesn't take very long to drive from El Paso to which, which is where he was to the Mexican border. Um, that was uh, that attempted deportation was blocked by a court, a U.S. court, U.S. Court of Immigration Appeals, and um, and so instead of letting him go, immigration officials there um, detained him, and uh, we could not figure out why. Uh, and I called and I said, is there something about this case we don't understand? Uh, is there something we don't know? Couldn't get a good answer. Um, and uh, asked, asked again and months went by and uh, I was puzzled by why weeks went by and then, then they turned into months. But before, before they turned into months, because I could not get a straight answer from our government. Why were you holding this guy? He hadn't broken any laws. He had a legitimate, by our government's own, you know, legitimate asylum request that was being adjudicated. He, um, there were all these news organizations, the press club, the Reporters Without Borders, the Committee to Protect Journalists, and the Bishop of El Paso were all saying, let this guy out. He hasn't done anything wrong. And they wouldn't. So I couldn't figure out. So what did I do? I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. And I said, I want all the records involved in this case because I started to suspect when I couldn't get a good answer for my question that there was something shady going on. Was this guy a victim of discrimination? This was under the Trump administration. As you re might recall, Mexicans and journalists are not two groups of people high on the former president's you know, favorites list. <laughs> so I wondered what was going on. And you know, I think I was on to something because two days before a judge ordered the Department of Homeland Security to turn over the records I asked for, they let Emilio out instead. <laughs> Information is power. Information needs to be public. And the public needs to make sure it stays that way. Mm -hmm. So thank you for listening. Before I take your questions, I will let you know I have some resources uh, on at the end of this slideshow so you can uh, know how to file these requests. Um, and then uh, I have some sources. If you're interested in going more deeply into the history of the Sunshine Law, uh, you can do that. And I will make this link available to uh, the Danny Boone Regional Library and the um, League of Women Voters, and then you can share it with your members. So uh, by all means, uh, share. And um, I should have put my email address on here, but it's Kylie K, K I E L Y K at Missouri.edu. And I'll share that with you too. So if you have any questions uh, that you don't get asked, asked, answered here today, uh, you can ask me. So what do we got? Oh, uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. A follow up to your last statement. Can you enumerate 
some specific steps citizens can take to protect the sunshine law? Yes, talk to your lawmakers. I mean, absolutely. You know, I, I will tell you something. I covered Congress for well, close to 40 years, and I mean, <laughs> the, the um, elected representatives listen to voters. Um, yes, money in politics is very influential, um, but, you know, there's still more voters than there are dollars, or at least, you know, I've seen many, many people who have a lot of money in their campaigns just go like a big hot air balloon. Um, if the public is paying attention to the races and if the public is asking the right questions. So I think the worst thing is to become so cynical about politics that you say it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I think if you go and you talk to your lawmakers, um, and in Missouri, particularly where this is gonna count, is at the state level. Your state reps and your state senators are gonna be really important. We're gonna, they're gonna start pre-filing bills uh, later, at, at late November, early December for the session that starts in January. And I think it's, you know, it's not too soon to start telling them what you think about this. On the federal level, um, obviously you're members of Congress and, and senators, but I think, um, I think people need to hear from people who vote. And that is, uh, that is really important. I write to my members, you know, now that I'm not a working reporter, I write to my members about things that I think are important. So I'm going to do that later today about a, a journalist who's been imprisoned in, in Niger, actually. And um, and so I, I just think you, you can't, you, you have to believe that the people who are elected to rep represent you will do that. Give them a chance. Your story about Mexican journalists, did you ever get the material that you asked for or if they do, if the government does something related to it, is it hidden? Um, okay, really good question. Um, so when Emilio was um, released from detention, that mooted the uh, the federal case. So we did. It's a very complicated case, but <laughs> we ended up having to bring a habeas corpus case to get him out of jail. And in the course of discovery for that habeas, we, we made the FOIA, like, because FOIA takes a long time. So our lawyer said, the judge cited something I had gotten from an early FOIA release that was very suspicious and said, yeah, that makes me think we should have a trial in this case. And so then our lawyer said, judge, uh, maybe we should get all these records on discovery, which is much faster than FOIA, because when a judge says you need to produce these records, you can't mess around. And that's what triggered his release. So what I did right away, because he was released from detention, but he still didn't have asylum. And I wasn't sure he would get that. I re-upped the FOIA. And I got, the, I up here, I've given you one of the resources I give you is Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Um, they have a lot of good information about how to file FOIA requests. They also represent journalists, and they are my lawyers on this case, and we are still pressing that case. But here's the good news. Last month, Emilio got word that his asylum was accepted, that he is eligible for asylum. And now a court in El Paso has set the date of March 18th for his end. But I am not going to take my foot off the gas until I see the paper in his hands. So, and then maybe, but to answer your question, I've gotten a lot of records from the government, like thousands of pages. A lot of it's repetitive. There's a lot of chum. Um, so that's what you'll see a lot of times with a FOIA response or a sunshine response. There'll be a lot of detrius in there. And you have to be patient enough to go through it and find the stuff you need. The thing that got Emilio out of prison was one line at the bottom of page after page after page after page of redacted information. It was the heading on the email and then one line way down at the bottom. So they don't make it easy for you. And that's why that's why journalists tend to be the ones who are doing this a lot because we get paid to do it. 
Um, and so, uh, and it takes a lot of time and patience, but if you have something in your community that you care about, you really need to not only get the records, but even if they're, they're redaction after redaction, you have to stick with it. And then what we are doing now is we're challenging the redactions. We're saying, why are you redacting this stuff? Did you find out why he was? I don't know. I, I have my suspicions. But I haven't found, I haven't known that. In other words, that wasn't in the information. There, there's enough in that information. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence and really snarky remarks that suggest, yes, that I was right. Mm -hmm. yeah. who, who gets to decide what information is too sensitive and what gets redacted? Is that a neutral party that, in looking at the documents, then gets to decide? Well, that also is a good question. Um, the um, most agencies have an, a separate unit that is their Freedom of Information Act unit, and they review the records and make decisions about whether this should be redacted or that should be redacted. Do we know? And then <clears throat> you really need to let the legal system work. Um, so in the case, in my case with Emilio, um, I felt there were so many redactions that I felt uh, this looks really suspicious. I mean, this isn't like a national security case or something. You know, this this shouldn't be. So we're challenging that in court. So you so the first line of defense is uh, professional people, and and you know honestly, I will say this. I have to say this. The counter <laughs> a lot of people are going to say, oh, well, that's a FOIA officer for the agency. So they're going to do what their colleagues want. Not necessarily. You know, um, what people say what mean when they talk about the deep state is actually a good thing. Most civil servants are really dedicated to the jobs they do. They're not there to do a bad job, right? So for instance, uh, People look down at the Federal Election Commission because the actual commissioners are political appointees and they do tend to vote according to party. But if you talk to the staff of the Federal Election Commission, I have found them to be incredibly helpful. They really believe and they want people to know where money and politics is going. They will really help you. So similarly, I think there are a lot of FOIA officers in the government who believe in what they're doing. And, and I have met the people who work for Andrew Bailey. I've met the people on the Sunshine staff. They're fantastic. So, and they really, they come out, they'll do trainings, they're great. So that's your first line of defense, those people. And then if you feel like I did, there's too many redactions here, I'm not getting what I really need, you can challenge it first with them. And the, initially, when we challenged it, we did get more information from the government, and then we but we still didn't feel like we were getting it all. So we pushed further, and we took it to court. And so you can do that. So there are checks and balances. I should probably know this, but I don't. If I wanted to find out what legislation is being introduced for next year in, in our state that relates to the Sunshine Law, what website do I go to? How do I get that information? Yeah, well, uh, uh, the newspapers are going to start to write about this stuff. Um, but there, if you go to um, the Missouri legislature, the legislature's website, um, you can find it there. And um, I don't know if I can call it up here. Can I do that? Can I jump on the web? Or, um, so, uh, and I know there's a question in the back too. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. Oh, wait, but the people will probably want to see it, right? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Let's see. Let's go here. Let's go. Sorry, this is not my computer, so I'm a little thinking of typing on it. So. I don't use this site all the time, but um, I've been Missouri Post. Here we go. So, um, you know, now what's the the trick is going to be um, 
you're going to want to go to each body because there's no one-stop shopping. Say, here's all the bills. Um, but if we go, say, to the Missouri State House of Representatives, none of them will have been, um, but here you go, pre-filed bills. So house.mo.gov, pre-filed bills. And um, and I don't think this is... Doesn't start till December. Yeah, first. so I don't think, yeah, thank you, Mari. So I, that's not... But you're but starting in December, you can go there and you'll be able to see that. And then um, let's see if we can find something similar for the Senate. Um, I just want to also interject that um, the pre-filing starts December 1st. So what Kathy was able to pull up there was from last year's pre-file bills. But um, also, you're welcome to uh, follow our newsletter. The Women Voters does share information about policy issues that we're concerned about pretty regularly. And if you're a member of League of Women Voters, you can sign up to get legislative alerts that actually tell you uh, things that are coming up for hearing or times when your voice would be most effective to be heard. There's a gentleman in the back. That one on my question too, and I'll, and I'll go to you in the back. Um, someone online is asking, how many other states have sunshine laws? I know FOIA is the federal, when we have a Missouri sunshine law. Yeah, how many other states? All 50 states have some form of sunshine law now. Yeah, okay, so I first. suppose that there's some legislator down there who is sincere and speaks in good faith and says, I don't really understand why an email from my constituent complaining about the feral cats has to be released to somebody. Okay, uh, thank and, you. And, 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 and yeah, so assure us how easy it is to protect the random constituent who doesn't want to be dragged into any mud fights. Okay, all right, this is a really good question. And this is one of the things that the lawmakers are really making a big issue of, um, because in 2018, as part of the big, uh, there was a big omnibus referendum put in front of the voters here, and that was before I got here, but it was national news because uh, it would have, it did a whole bunch of things. And gerrymandering, that didn't work out so well. Um, uh, put stricter lobbying restrictions and campaign finance restrictions on, and also open up state legislative records to sunshine. I'm going to admit that this has become much harder, a much more difficult issue in the digital era. And here's why. Because back in the olden days, when you had a couple of newspapers and they were all run by professionals and a couple of TV stations and a couple of radio stations, yes, there was, as we've talked about in the class, um, there was a, a kind of a cabal, really. I mean, there was, the, you know, there was a, it was a limited amount of information coming from a limited amount of sources. Now we have the internet. And everybody with one of these or one of those phones is a publisher. And not everybody's been trained to be a reporter. And here's the problem. If I'm a reporter and I have to go back to the well again, first of all, I'm trained in ethics. I'm trained in law. And so I have some understanding of what I can and can't do responsibly. So I wouldn't put that person's name in the Columbia, Missouri. But some blogger might. So that's become a problem. And there are people, you know, the internet in some ways is the biggest threat to the First Amendment that's ever existed, even though it's supposed to make it better, because you have irresponsible people doing irresponsible things. And that makes it easy for people to say, let's just end it. Okay, let's just come. But here's the problem a constituent is also a corporation. Right. Remember that the Supreme Court has said that corporations are people. So are we gonna say, I don't wanna see what corporation XYZ who wants to put a sledge pile next to my kid's school is writing to my lawmaker? I would like to see that. I think you would too. So I think if we're going to make those, I, I agree that there are that you keep, you know, every right comes with a responsibility, right? Even the First Amendment. 
you have to have some, you know, no, no right is absolute. We live in a system of checks and balances. So how do we do that? So if we are going to put those kind of protections in, we need to, at the same time, protect the public's right to know. So I hear what people are saying, and I'm going to tell you there are reporters who are sympathetic to this, but you need to get people in, in a room and actually negotiate this. And I know for a fact, Gene Manneke is a wonderful person and talks to state lawmakers all the time. If we compromise, there's a word you don't hear very often these days, <laughs> we might be able to come up with an answer to that. Um, but I, I think it's a real problem. Um, and I will tell you this, I can right now go and find out on the Federal Election Commission, I could go and find out every single person who gave a contribution to Josh Hawley and every single person who gave a contribution in this city. And I could put a map with your addresses on it. I'm not going to do that because there are too many nut jobs out there, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not going to do it. But I think that we have to, I may write other stuff. I may say this percentage of people in this county gave to this senator or that, you know, I might do a zip code map, but I'm not going to do that. And I think that's the kind of thing we, we, there are ways you can make information. What a journalist does is a journalist thinks before we put something in the paper, if it's shifty, what is the public good from publishing this? But it, it sounds like you're making an elliptic argument that all these other publishers should lose the exceptions they've been given by the court. I mean, basically, the numb nuts and the idiots have to be held to the same responsibility that bona fide journalists are. Seems to be what you're saying. Well, I kind of think if you publish, you should be responsible. Yeah, <laughs> stuff you publish. And if you're making money off it, okay. you know, you should be responsible. That would be full employment for my students if these platforms had to hire actual editors who've been trained in actual ethics. <laughs> but that's another that's another talk. That's section two thirty. Yeah, but it is a problem. Uh, uh, for the sunlight, it is a problem, but I think a blanket exception for constituent right. communications is going to hide a lot of stuff that we don't want hidden. That's my problem with it. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Is there one in the room? There's one. There's one here online asking, um, are the HIPAA laws a possible model for what we're um, advocating for? Um, you know, I don't know enough about the HIPAA laws, um, but of course what we're talking about is laws that protect uh, privacy, patient privacy, um, but then I guess you still want to allow enough aggregated data available so that we can make intelligent public health decisions. So I think that's an interesting idea. If I knew more about the HIPAA laws, I could uh, answer that. One of my students who's going to be a lawyer may be able to do that in a few years. But um, <laughs> but uh, I think that is, but that's the kind of conversation we need to start having. What are the ways that we can preserve the information, the openness of the information that the public genuinely has the right to know and protect the other stuff? And I think that, you know, one, one other thing I will say, uh, another thing you're going to hear a lot about is the cost and uh, the five people who are working at uh, Andrew Bailey's office are paid by you. And so one of the first things to go down if we have a government shutdown is open records requests. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I was working in D.C., the last government shutdown, they even closed the Federal Elections Commission databases, which seemed really stupid because they were online and available. But no, you know, their argument was, well, if something goes wrong, there's nobody to fix it. And um, so as taxpayers, we really need to say to, we're willing to pay for this. This is an important public service and we're willing to pay for it. And uh, because it's really easy for somebody to just cut that staff and not have that available. Um, and so one of the questions we need to ask when somebody says, oh, we can't get to your request for 600 years, it is how many people do you have working on this? And then if it's too few, go and home to the Congress or the legislature, the people who hold the purse strings and say, this is important to me as a constituent. 
this is where I want my tax dollars to go. Some of them. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give her a Thank you. On behalf of the library and the League of Women Voters and AAUW, thank you so much for being here. Um, our next Lunch and Learn is going to be November 8th, and it's, again, going to be on Zoom and in the room. And uh, we um, are going to hear about Columbia's solid waste and recycling program. So please join us then. Thank you all again for attending. Have a great time. Thank you. Thank you.